Hey, everybody. Today's Real Vision program is sponsored by Engrave, maker of the coldest hardware wallet, Zero, and stainless steel backup graphene. Engrave brings you the highest security in a touchscreen experience to safely manage all of your crypto offline. Enjoy a 10% Real Vision discount in Engrave.io shop with the code REALVISION. Enjoy the program. Hi, my name's Raul Pal, and welcome to my show, The Journeyman. And The Journeyman, I think you know by now, is my journey of understanding into the nexus of macro, crypto, and the exponential age of technology. You see, I think all of these mega trends are all headed in the same place. That the structure of how economies work has changed and the opportunity set for all of us has changed, particularly from the past. And one of the things that I look at in macro is how do you use the business cycle and secular trends interwoven to find the best opportunities? You see, crypto was one of the big ones for me where I could see the secular trend But until I did the deep dive on the business cycle to understand things like the everything code, I couldn't fit it into my existing framework. But I cracked that. I cracked the code of crypto and how it works in the business cycle. And I've probably done more work on the macro side of crypto than anybody else in the world. And I've built out an incredible array of indicators and um, analyses all within the database that we have at Global Macro Investor, which is my institutional research service. And that has given us a really deep understanding of how the space works. Things like, you know, not only when when should you be in or out of the crypto cycle, but when should you be in the alt cycle, when you should be in Bitcoin versus ETH or ETH versus Bitcoin, whatever it may be. So we did a ton of work that even the NFT cycle and how that fits into macro. But that business cycle also is a key part of other assets. Not everybody's a crypto investor, after all. Um, And that may be, how do you think about emerging markets? So like emerging markets to me, I look at emerging markets, how they fit into the business cycle, how they've been performing versus that business cycle framework. So they do go up and down with the business cycle, but the secular trends at play as well. And the secular trend, once you peel back the layers of the onion, you do the hard work, you see that India is probably at the center of it in terms of emerging markets. The last 10, 20 years was the story of China. Before that, it was the Asian tigers. And now it's most likely India and the monsoon countries, those countries surrounding India in the Indian Ocean, particularly including the Middle East, places like Saudi Arabia. And then there's technology itself. Technology is another mega secular trend. And within it, you can use a business cycle framework to understand it. Now, many people get thrown off the technology rodeo because they start getting concerned about valuations and how things work because they don't really understand technology itself. It took me a hell of a long time to understand how to invest in it. But eventually, I started to come to grips with the secular trend, the world we're in, what it all means for valuations, and then how the business cycle can be overlaid to make the risk reward of investing better. And as you know, time of recording this, so this is what Wednesday, the 24th of January, uh, 2024, we're at the point where all of these are playing out perfectly, where the secular trends and the business cycle are now pushing forwards. Now, many of you who will be watching this later will find that Maybe the business cycle has changed after 2025, but right now we're at that sweet spot. So a a lot of people hear about these sectors or different countries and think, well, how the hell do I get exposure to that? Now, there are ways, so if you're more sophisticated, you can get exposure directly, but the ETF world exploded and created a lot of this. And so... I think ETFs now make it easy for people to build robust portfolios around sectoral themes that match these secular views. And I wanted to make this whole process much easier because this is the process that the hedge funds, the world's largest asset managers and everybody else uses to drive better returns. And so that process of business, deep business cycle analysis 
is actually quite hard for people. People are like, I kind of get it, but I don't know how to do it. You know, how do I overlay charts of the S&P 500 against the ISM survey? What things should I be looking at for forward-looking indicators? How do I really understand where I am in the cycle? Is it macro spring, crypto spring, crypto summer, macro summer? What the hell do I do? And I know it's hard. And I know at Real Vision, we've got the Real Vision Academy and the business cycle courses that I've done and my colleague Julian Bittle has done and Andreas Steno Larson. So that helps you have the foundation. But Julian Bittle and I hacked it even further. We wanted to make it idiot proof. Well, in fact, he made it idiot proof for me. I've been doing this a very long time in the business cycle analysis, one of the longest people in the world doing it. Uh, you know, David Rosen Rosenberg's been doing it longer than I have. But really what I want to do is distill this all down. And I asked Julian to help me build something out, which is something called the macro investing tool. And the macro investing tool not only tells you where you are in the secular cycles, where you are in the business cycle itself, what season you're in to make it really easy to understand, and then what assets you should think about owning. Now, this is not a trading model by this sell this. It's like if you were to allocate assets in macro spring, where we are today, moving towards macro summer, what are the assets that are likely to outperform the most? That's what helped us get technology absolutely bang on last year. The semiconductors and the NASDAQ were up well over 50% and our exponential age basket was up almost 100%. It got us exactly right in crypto. Uh, that really helped too. Um, it also has covered India for us. It's got many things right. Um, it, it's not there to be totally fallible, but it will put the odds in your favor. So right now, there's a free trial for anybody within Real Vision. So if you're a Real, Real Vision subscriber, realvision.com, or go and get a, a, a trial of it as well, you'll see the macro investing tool. Um, I think it's one of those valuable tools that we can give you. Yes, it costs a little bit on top of your Real Vision subscription. Go to the Real Vision, uh, the marketplace uh, that you'll see at the top of your screen when you're there. And you can scroll through all of the incredible offerings from many of our partners. And the macro investing tool is there. I think it's the one tool that will make you from a macro learner to a macro expert overnight and put the odds in your favor. I did this because I wanted to change people's lives to really help them have the tools that really were the tools for Wall Street or people who are charging thousands for the research like I do at Global Macro Investor. I wanted to give it to you to give the opportunity. I want to democratize this kind of stuff. So there it is. The macro investing tool will help you. This conversation I've got coming up now is a conversation with a friend of mine, which is all about these things. You see, Jan Van Eck is a pioneer of sector ETFs and country ETFs. He literally gives you the tools to be able to implement these strategies. And he pioneered it with the gold ETF, of which is one of the biggest ETFs in the world. But also he has you know, countries like India. He also has things like the semiconductor ETF, SMH, which I use frequently. He has many of the tools available. And so I wanted to chat to Yan because he's a brilliant thinker, super nice guy, and I want to understand how he thinks, how he sees the opportunity sets, and where the world is going. Now, also, don't forget, Yan sees the big picture. So Yan's been in crypto for a while too. So I wanted to get his crypto journey and his journey to the ETF. So look, I really hope you enjoy it. There's lots to learn from in here. Think about that macro investing tool. Now, if you're not a Real Vision member, just go for free, realvision.com, and sign up. And there you'll get so much stuff that will help you in your journey. I can't stress it enough. It's free for you. I built it for you in my promise to help democratize this information. So I know a lot of you are watching this on YouTube. Others are watching on the platform and can see the full experience the AI tools, the charting, the community tools, the transcripts, the note-taking, and all of the features we're building out. But if you're not, please go over there because really, it'll change your game. Um, anyway, hope to see you there and enjoy the interview and great discussion with Jan Van Eck. Join me, Raoul Powell, as I go on a journey of discovery through the macro, crypto, and exponential age landscapes. In The Journeyman, I talk to the smartest people in the world so we can all become smarter together. 
Jan Van Eck, how the devil are you? Um, I'm doing really well, thank you. It's great to get you back on Real Vision, and you and I have actually not sat down, even though we've known each other for a long time, we've not actually sat down and and chatted on camera. I just thought it would be a great opportunity. Well, it's, uh, I really want to hear what you're thinking too. Yeah, well, de- definitely. We can have a two-way conversation. But before we start, I think a little bit of an intro about yourself and the story of Van Eck. Because I think you know people always want to hear how businesses get built and, and what you've done and stuff like that. Um, so that would be super interesting. Sure. I mean, I can give you the short version. Uh, Van Eck, the firm, was started by my father in 1955. Um, and our investment philosophy, I think I would describe it as macro. And what I mean by that is looking at big trends um, in the world, economic, political, and technology-wise, um, and saying, okay, the world actually affects the financial markets. And what are the big trends? You know, what are the asset classes that are going to develop? So in 1955, my father put together an international equity mutual fund. Um, there, were, there were none the year before. Um, there was one other person uh, who started that year, John Templeton. And then probably what my father is best known for is in 1968, he sold almost all those international stocks and bought gold mining shares because he thought gold was going to uh, benefit from the inflationary monetary and fiscal policies of the U.S. government. Now, I like to point out that gold had been fixed against the dollar for the entirety of U.S. history. And, and you know, if you know anything about financial theory, if an asset um, is, you know, flat in price, it has no volatility, it has no risk, it's sort of a weird object to want to buy. But anyway, that bet really worked out in 1971. Gold ended up going to up to over $800 uh, an ounce. And uh, so it's that kind of macro thinking um, that, that leads to the evolution of asset classes. We participated in, in the development of the emerging markets was a big theme for us. Uh, the commodity trends of the 2000s and then um, you know, crypto is, is something, I'm not sure it's an asset class, but it's uh, definitely something that um, we think deserves a place in people's portfolio. So that's kind of it. And we don't, um, I should say most macro managers, Raul, will put every all their ideas into one fund. Uh, well, we we don't. We sort of explain our view of the world and let investors kind of pick a slice, if you will, of exposure, um, like crypto or or GDX for gold miners or something like that, rather than having one big macro fund. Yeah, I mean that's where you guys have been such pioneers. I mean, people may be very familiar with some of your ETF products without even realizing it's you guys, because you guys have always been incredibly thematic. Talk me through the ETF journey. We'll, we'll get onto crypto later, but the, the journey of how you guys thought about getting involved in ETFs, because you were an early player and been quite a dominant player in it as well. Yeah, we, uh, we got into ETFs in 2006. That's when GDX launched. Um, back in those days, uh, you had to, uh, before the ETF rule, you had to get SEC approval for every ETF, almost like we just saw with the, um, the Bitcoin ETFs. And so I actually started working on it in 2004 on the weekends and putting applications together. And it's sort of like you needed that magic key or that magic phrase. And we got a better securities lawyer who finally got us through the SEC process. Um, I think intellectually, it was a little bit easier for me since I'm not literally a portfolio manager just to say, hey, wait a minute, this vehicle has tax advantages for U.S. investors. And if I know anything about investors, they prefer something that has a tax advantage than, than the one that doesn't. Um, and also uh, in school, I'd studied under some professors who thought you know, that active management was going to die and passive management was the way. So, uh, And then obviously, politically, I wasn't operating within an asset management firm that was run only by active portfolio managers. Um, we were a little bit more entrepreneurial than that. So, so I think those were the those were the things that got us involved. And our business, um, you know, I don't know what we are like a top fifteen ETF sponsor. We we manage uh, about ninety billion today. But our first ETFs were just first to market, like the first Vietnam fund or the first gold miners or the first ag shares. And over the last decade or so, we've more focused on funds with like I would say a twist to them because you know markets have these interesting 
kind of kind of structural problems. Like uh, one of my favorites is the fallen angel high yield ETF. So for some reason, <laughs> when bonds get, they may come out as investment grade, but when they get downgraded to junk, uh, many institutions are forced to sell them. And so they'll go down 10 to 20 points for really no particular reason. Um, and then the, the strategy of this ETF is just to buy them when that downgrade happens. Um, and, and often those bonds uh, recover uh, dramatically. Uh, the two big bites at the apple, I would say, were 2016 and 2020 when oil prices you know, almost went to zero and energy bonds got destroyed and this strategy just gobbled them up and um, has out, in those years outperformed a high yield index by something like 20%. So th that's been our gig, I would say, for the last 10 years, more of that kind of exposures. And we'll come on to the, some of the more active stuff you're doing as well. But, you know, I'm, I've always been fascinated by the suite of products that you have because anybody can kind of run a hedge fund essentially by using the suite of products. And, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not biased in this. I just think the, the suite of products you have is incredibly flexible. If you think commodities are running, you've got the opportunity. If you think technology, you've got SMH. If you think gold, you've got gold. If you think emerging markets, you've got emerging markets. So anybody can kind of run a very straightforward asset allocation with quite defined risks by doing it, which I think is is somewhat unique. And because that's kind of all you do. At, at this point, yeah, we have a lot of ETFs. It's flattering of you to, to describe it that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I always find it super useful. So let's talk about your macro view. Uh, and we can have a discussion around that. As, how are you seeing the world right now and going forwards? I know that's a big open-ended question, but you know we'll have a discussion as we go. You know, I think I think we're in a uh, an unfun spot. Um, last year, I sort of described uh, a, a reasonable strategy as sideways, which was forty sixty overweighting fixed income, um, not expecting a lot from financial assets, and that was dead right <laughs> until the beginning of November. And then in November, it wasn't a month, it was a year. It was 2024. 2024 is over. I'm kind of exaggerating, but because the markets are so amazingly fast at pricing in the future these days, right? So all of the Fed, you know, kind of weakening or loosening, however you want to describe it, was seemingly priced in, you know, kind of in, in the fourth quarter of 2023. So now we're in this sort of, I think there's, it's hard to describe any extremes in the financial markets where there's a real opportunity. I mean, you know, you look at the Magnificent Seven, sure, but then if you look at the, uh, an equal weighted version of U.S. large cap equities, pretty, pretty reasonable. Um, and I just, so I, I don't see a lot of extremes even within the markets. Uh, Small caps were hit because banks were hit last year for for obvious reasons um, because they had misstructured their port their 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 balance sheets. But uh, um, you know you still have you know so if you think about sideways 2.0, there are three main macro ingredients to anything. Uh, to our governments, right? So you look at fiscal policy. Is the U.S. government going to spend a lot of money this year? I, I doubt it, right? Um, because the Republicans are in control of the House, so that's kind of flattish. Um, and then you look at monetary policy. I, I've kind of said I think a lot of the loosening is sort of priced in. So I don't I don't see the the Fed gets getting super stimulative. And then global growth is kind of you know is challenged because Europe has structurally higher energy prices and because China is letting if you will the markets work its way out of their property problems. So. Um, you know, it's sort of a meh <laughs> in the middle. Um, I, I quote something, I, I don't know if you know Josh Brown, the commentator, but he says this quote, which I will not repeat uh, verbatim, but, you know, market tops are a process, market bottoms are an event, and uh, the middle is an mf -er. <laughs> And I think that's where we're kind of <laughs> In right now, I, I I don't know. That's my my kind of sense. So I call it sideways. Josh Brown calls it something else. Um, but uh, you know, surely there will be events. But that's kind of where I see it. Listen, you still want to be invested in financial assets almost all the time, uh, except for when the Fed is is raising rates. 
I think that's when it's almost legit to talk about cash. Um, but otherwise, um, you know, that's that's kind of my view. Listen, I'm a strong believer that the yield curve should normalize and and uh, steepen because you take more risk on the long end. So you should always be paid more for taking greater risk. But I'm not really sure. I have trouble telling you what my takeaways are from that process other than, you know, some you know people want to normalize their portfolios. But as I mean, the banks are going to soar. I don't think so. You know, I, I just don't know what the takeaway is from that normalization. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm definitely more constructive than you. I've just used that the, the framework of liquidity and that global liquidity itself. You know, if we think about step back and look at global liquidity, so Fed liquidity, okay, there's a lot of offsets, but the net liquidity has been rising a bit. Okay, great. Going forwards, it's an election year. Um Going forwards, there's going to be some rate cuts come in because rates are too high for the overall trend level of growth. Okay, fine. So let's assume you're right that that's kind of nothing wild one way or the other. Maybe this fiscal, they try and force it through. Maybe they run down the treasury accounts to inject some money for because they want to bribe people with candy for the election, right? So they always do that. But then I look at China, and China's a car crash right now. So I look at the implied probability of them doing more, um, you know, more stimulus. I think that's reasonably high. And the Europeans probably too, because their economy is worse state than the US. Uh, Japan's probably a bit of a wash right now. Inflation's come down. So I just think liquidity comes comes in, in 24 and 25, much as we've seen in every one of these kind of cycles. And that um, if I look at the forward-looking indicators, it seems to suggest that continues for a while. And in which case, I just think, you know, one of the best trades I had last year outside of crypto was the SMH. It was beautiful. And if I just look at, you know, the tech cycle, okay, if liquidity is going to be okay, or maybe enhanced by others, and then we've got this ridiculous amount of ordering. I mean, everyone's out competing for ordering chips right now for AI. You think, you know, technology is probably going to be fine. I can't see a reason why it's not. The only thing technology hates is inflation. And we've kind of killed that for the time being, whether it comes back or not. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm generally much more constructive. Also look at the just the election year pattern. You know, it's a simple thing. But election years just tend to be good because they try and stimulate, hand out some bribery, uh, that kind of stuff. But, you know, the markets have gone a long way. and Probably still have to digest a bit like crypto is doing now. It's got a lot of digestion to do. Because you know a lot of money poured in, as you said, it was a huge last quarter, and that needs to pour. So yeah, I'm probably I'm probably less thinking about a sideways year, but it's always possible, and then miserable when you get them. Yeah, I mean, listen, you you generally want to own financial assets, right? So I'm not in any way sort of uh, I, I would take your side, bro. I'm not I'm not fighting you. I'm just I'm doing it with maybe a little bit less enthusiasm, but maybe that's just my personality. I will. I would add to to your list um, emerging markets, because emerging market, um, you know, central banks were very tight, and they've started the process of loosening, and they've got further to go. Forgetting China for a second, right? Um, but if you look at uh, EMEA and, and and LATAM, I mean, what you can still get double digit interest rates in in Brazil, I think so. Um, I think you're right. If, and, and, and China is exporting deflation. That's another bullish argument, right, for, for interest rates. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I am with you. I'm just, you know, as I said, a little less enthusiastic because so much happened in the fourth quarter. Um, the other thing I looked at, talking of emerging markets, is really interesting. I, and you and I have chatted about this in the past. I adjusted all markets by the Fed balance sheet to look at the debasement of currency effect. So divide the S&P by the Fed balance sheet, divide gold, divide um, NASDAQ, divide everything. Really interesting. We've all done that with gold in the past to use it as the denominator. But because we're debasing currency, I, I did it with all assets. And what we found is after 2008, the S&P has been sideways, real estate sideways, gold sideways to down, the NASDAQ up, it's a secular bull market. We kind of understand that. Crypto obviously la la land because it's a it's a new asset class and it's been adopted and then the and then emerging markets 
down, except India. India was the one secular bull market that in dollar terms versus the Fed balance sheet, everything, it's the only one that seems to be uh, doing better. And you guys have set up a, you've had an India fund for a while, but I know Angus and and you've set up another strategy. Talk through that as well. I know Angus has been on and talked about it, but, you know, India is one of, A, I'm half Indian, but it's also a passion of mine because of the demographics and the secular tailwinds, which is almost the opposite of the Western world. And that's why I you always know, think it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, listen, what, what I, um, I started getting into history maybe a decade ago, and, and I teach it to our summer interns, the sort of financial markets and things like that. And um, I get triggered now, or I got triggered last year. I was sitting in a board meeting. I won't say, tell you, say which one. It wasn't one of ours. And they, were, they basically spent 90% of their energy trying to figure out what was going to happen in, in the U.S. and Chinese economies in 2023. This was a year ago. <laughs> like, this is so silly because if you take the bigger picture trends like demographics and technology, you can – take a five-year view with a high degree of conviction, right? So what can you pound the table on? So that's, yes, I, Angus and I are both very pro, uh, pro-India. pro Why? Because from a three-year-out perspective, looking back, aren't you going to have wanted to own the two mobile phone companies there, right? So basically the story is, as you know, super well, right? They dropped cell phone um, usage, data costs, and the cost of physical devices. So the vast bulk of the India economy is now digitized through their mobile phones. And and you've got two companies. So you've got a duopoly that have pricing power. Now, they're more um, hardware-oriented today than I'll call it our Magnificent Seven. But they're also investing in software as well. So, you know, the way I simplify it, Raul, is like, okay, Take investing over the last 30 years. Did you want to bet against the internet? No, right? So I define, you know, these Magnificent Seven as effectively our pipes into the internet in the United States. Take the two pipes in India and invest in them. And from a three or five year perspective, you're going to be super happy. Um, We can get to the asset of the internet later when we talk about crypto. Yeah, I mean, I've gone through a whole journey of i don't know if you've seen that bell curve meme where there's the moron and the and the jedi and then in the middle is everybody overcomplicating everything and <laughs> and like you i i am now ultra I, i'm happy to be on the left being the moron which is like india young population no debt and a complete technological revolution why would you not own this? We've seen this before. I, I developed a thesis called Monsoon. And what I did is back in, I don't know, 2013, 14, had we just gone through the, the, the financial crisis and then the European crisis, I thought this debt thing is a fucking mess. So I got a map of the world and I said, right, I'm going to take out every indebted country that's excess debts and then took out everybody with an aging demographic and said, what's left of the world? And once you ignore some of the African countries because they were too small, you basically got a world centered around India and all of the Middle East down to Singapore, Indonesia, and all across North Africa and up as high as Iran. And what you and this was the old monsoon trade winds. This was the old spice route. They have been trading for several 5,000 years together. And I looked at it and it really struck me because they've all got young populations. They've all got low household debts, low government debts, and rapidly growing economies. And I just said, well, I'm just going to keep it simple. That is where you want to be with your money and you don't want to be in old economies. Yeah. I think um, where a lot, listen, I would say my, your average American investor has given up entirely on emerging markets. And, and one of the th- stories that they heard was sort of the demographic growth, if you will, and that didn't translate into good stock market returns. And so I kind of try to downplay the, the GDP growth argument aspect of it and more just, hey, India is free market oriented, they're development oriented, um, and they're, I would call it 
um, you know, pro capital return oriented. It didn't. It didn't used to be that way. What, what the revolution that that triggered me for India was actually Infosys, because um, so this was the first sort of I'll call it Indian outsourced company that was a huge success. Not the first one necessarily, but the biggest. And what it demonstrated to the market was that you could get rich through the public equity markets. Because sometimes in India, the equity markets, were, there was a little bit of abuse of minority shareholders and there was a lot of gamesmanship and just wasn't the most efficient or investor friendly market. And I think to me, Infosys was a big mind changer for a generation. Now that generation is fully baked into the market now, right? They don't even think about that. Um, but you know that now we're now we're well into that. So I think that kind of positive mentality, approach to markets, approach to investing is a very, very important component. Um, and I leave out the growth aspect for my Americans that <laughs> that don't want to hear about um, you know kind of emerging markets. Yeah, and the financialization of the middle classes of India, right? If you look at the number of brokerage accounts being opened, you know crypto holdings, you see all of this, and then. You know, the other trigger for me, I've been involved in the Indian market for a while based on this thesis, but the big trigger was uh, Reliance. When they, because my cousin was running American Tower in India. Um, so he was in the mobile phone market. He was ex McKinsey and, and General Electric. And um, I was speaking to him about what was going on in his business. He said, there's a crazy war going on with Reliance coming in, driving the price down to zero, I mean, literally zero. To take market share, and he's like, I don't know who's going to go bust or if everybody's going to go bust, but this is the worst I've ever seen. Reliance managed to catch what sixty something percent of the entire market share, push half of them into bankruptcy or or mergers. Had borrowed what eighteen billion dollars to do this, and then just at the beginning of COVID, paid it all off because he raised the equity, which I'd never seen. That was the fastest payback of corporate debt probably in history. And it was at that point, I'm like, oh my God, okay, this guy's serious. And that really got me interested again. Yeah, I mean, listen, you probably know the market structure better than I do, but it is interesting how countries like Chai Bowls in South Korea, right, or trading companies in Japan, I mean, in, in China, it's the state-owned enterprises, and they're not even necessarily multi-industry conglomerates. But um, in India, there are these big family conglomerates, right? And I think it's um, viewed as a synergistic positive by the government to let them, as long as they're investing in what's good for India, so alternative energy or mobile phones, yeah, go go do it. You know, they're not, and, and stay out of politics, sorry, <laughs> right? As long as they do all that, it's, it's, it's really, um, I hate to say this, a harmonious relationship. Um, which is great for investors. Now, listen, I, we both know that the Indian market can be overvalued at times. Um, so it, Most of the time it trades expensive, right? Most of the time it's expensive, which stops many people buying and it keeps going up. Right. And, and listen, the biggest misses of my life, like Microsoft and Apple and everything, you know, I've missed because, you know, I've worried about the price. That's why I say, that's why I called them the screaming buys, but from a three-year perspective, right? In three years, looking back, what will be so obvious? <laughs> the internet has worked for three decades. It's not going to stop working in India, right? It'll be those companies that are going to have great, uh, should have good earnings and good growth. I think I think that's right. And just, you know, I, I asked on Twitter recently, I, I said, Will, you can see the pushback about technology investing or crypto investing, you know, People have some philosophical uh, differences around investing in that space because of the valuations and all of this stuff. But you asked a simple question. I said, in a year's time and five years' time, is the world going to be more digital or less digital? 96% of people said more digital. I'm like, well, that's why these stocks are going to keep going up. Sure, there'll be bear markets, there'll be ups and downs, but it's very difficult to break that secular trend unless something truly structural changes. Now, maybe it's AI causing it in 10 years' time or eight years' time, whatever, but right now, it's difficult to see. From a, and from a 10-year perspective, if you add up, I've got some other favorite EM countries, Saudi Arabia and Brazil, if you add them up with India, they're going to be bigger than Europe in 10 years, right? So the world continues to kind of um, 
you know, to kind of become more and more decentralized. People talk about deglobalization. I don't know what they're talking about. But maybe I could also, um, I do like to focus Americans' minds a little bit on Saudi Arabia. So no, we don't have a Saudi fund and I'm not pushing Saudi as a- You should do. I think it's, a, I think it's one of the best investment opportunities for the next 10 years. It's the, Tell me. The, the amount of change happening there is, is, you know, and listen, they're also coming from a country with very concentrated wealth in one sector. So they've got a long ways to go. But, you know, the, the allowing women to enter the workforce and giving them more social rights, huge game changer. They're using capital markets, the debt markets and the equity markets. We all remember Aramco going public, but that's just a symbol of bringing in discipline into their economy. Um, and then the biggest deal to me, and even with all the headlines over the last couple of months, I'm not sure people recall, Saudi and Iran reached a peace agreement. And that, that's like your arch enemies. I mean, you think Hamas and Israel fight, you know, so do the Sunnis and Shiites, right? So the fact that Saudi has really tried to, and, and they constantly are investing these billions of dollars to reorient their economy, I think is, is really interesting to watch. Um, maybe you need an active fund probably to take advantage of it. I would guess, I don't know. I, we decided not to do an ETF on Saudi, but I think it's really interesting. And I think the optimist in me hopes that it will frame um, a peace solution um, in Israel. Interesting. I've got exactly the same viewpoint. I because I've I've invested in the past in Iran and I've been I watched that story. I watched the Saudi story. It's part of this monsoon thesis, and I've seen the changes in Saudi. Saw the Iran and the fact that Saudi and Israel are friends. I'm like, okay, this is a potential. You know, we know there's a lot of trouble. But it seems that at the core, most of these countries are holding true to their agreements, you know, letting Israel clean up what it needs to do without causing majors. Yes, the Iranians cause a bit of problems around, but if those three can hold this together, then we've got a complete game changer in the Middle East. Yeah. And, and we don't know through the newspapers, at least, what the conversations are between Iran and Saudi Arabia right now. I mean, cl clearly... Things have heated up in the last month or so, so hopefully it doesn't get too bad. But at least in the first month, there was clear that there was a lot of conversations happening, and that's only you know that's only a good thing. Yeah, like you, I, I share the same optimism. What's your view on China? I mean, you guys have got China ETF, haven't you, or not? Yeah, we have we have two, um, and I and I should throw in a little bit of an infomercial on our Indian funds. We have uh, a general India fund that actually has a valuation screen on it to try to take out some of the overvalued companies. I don't know, if, you know, so far it's been working, but we'll see. Um, and then we have one that's just called Digital India. So it focuses on the kind of digital revolution. That's the new fund. That's the new fund, right? Yeah, D Dijin. Um, so, I, you know, as far as, uh, I, I'm not, I, I used to travel a lot to China. Um, we, we have an office there. I, I don't have any really profound insights. Um, it's just... Uh, the, what I've been talking about, which, you know, I'm not alone anymore, but uh, was the demographic uh, wave. And, um, you know, China aside, in Japan, uh, in 22, I guess it was the data. Do you know that like every county in Japan had fewer citizens except for Tokyo in 2022? Can you imagine, just think about the how an economy has to evolve, right? Housing demand, <laughs> there's fewer people, right? Um, so I, I feel like that's something that's um, in it. You know, people arguing with me on this. You know, how is it affecting China? China can still has this urban urbanization trend. There's counters to that whole demographic argument. It's not today. It's in ten years. I kind of think, you know, like the market's price and things. I think it. I think this demographic trend in China is in people's minds, um, and and it's going to be a headwind for their economy. Yeah, I mean, if I look at, if if I look at trend rate of GDP growth, it's generally driven by population growth plus productivity growth plus, let's say, debt growth. China and everybody finished the debt growth phase. Nobody can do anything more really with that. It's just been servicing old debts. Population Great growth. Great point. Yeah. They're all shrinking populations. So you've got productivity growth is the only thing and aging populations lower productivity. I don't know if you saw the front page of the FT today. I think it was today, um, which is a story I've been writing about for a while that Robots and AI are demographics, and there's 
they were talking about Japan is having to ramp up its robotics and AI capabilities to offset falling labor force. Now, what we're going to walk into is a world of infinite productive units, you know, human-like things, robots. And, you know, a- Amazon now employs, I think, more robots than it does humans. And so we will see that shift where we just get this almost infinite scale of knowledge plus physical labor at low cost. I mean, it, that's a that's a big deal that's coming. And it, it will help offset demographics, but not yet. We're not there yet. Super interesting. I love, I'm going back a little bit, I love your debt growth cycle. Because um, I think that's, you know, let, let, I would I would sort of, push on that a little bit, not, not against you, but um, I think it's not necessarily perceptive, perceptible from the outside because national government debt isn't sort of out of control, but it's the state and local debt, right, that where, where the issue is. And then somehow this sort of over-the-counter market debt related to the real estate markets. So just for me to ask you a question, you think they're kind of, I'll call it, over 80% done with that debt growth cycle in terms of it's being a boost to their economy? So I, I, I did some work in something called the Everything Code. I can't remember if I've sent it to you or not, but um, this was to show that everybody's economies changed in 2008. And what happened in 2008 is we had this like, call it a plaza record, a debt jubilee, where everybody said, we're going to cut interest rates to zero and forgive interest payments for a while. Right, and that lasts until like 2016, 17, when rates started rising again. Every government reset their government debt to this three to five years time horizon. And the business cycle has been clockwork every four years. Same as the Bitcoin halving cycle, same as the election cycle, and the macro cycle, the ISM cycle, they're all the same thing. And it's driven by this debt refi cycle. And so what I figured out in this everything code was that we reached the end of the ability to increase debt at government level because the government's all hit 100% of GDP in debt. And if you think of interest rates at 2%, just to make easy maths, and trend rate of GDP at 2%, therefore 100% of economic growth has to service the government interest. But the private sector's in debt. So what I suddenly discovered, and I think I was the first person or the only person to discover this, is all of the, the interest payments end up getting monetized on um, the Fed balance sheet the following cycle. So basically, they monetize everything above trend rate of GDP growth. And I found it was exactly the same in the UK, Europe, Japan. I'm like, holy shit, it's like they've all agreed to do the same thing, which is debase your currency, basically. It's financial repression. So I think China's in the same boat here that they can't get out of this trap either because the debt servicing costs keep keep going up. So basically, all of their activities, debt service costs, so that they have no choice but to use the balance sheet. Because as you rightly alluded to, government debt only looks like it's whatever the number is, 60% of GDP, but it's not because it's all the pseudo government debt um, at the next tier down. So they're probably somewhere close to Japan levels of debt, to call it 230%, 50% at government level, let alone the private sector. So that game can't go on. It's done. And I, and I think at a societal level, it's not just the, the interest rate payments. You also have to, there's debt write-offs. And so the cost in China is actually kind of higher because of their property problems, right? They're, it's The cost of debt is, yeah, the interest rates are coming down, but they're they're not getting some of their principal back. So um, it's more repressive. Uh, it's 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 a little bit more repressive just than their interest rates would too. Yeah, and it, and it really reminds me. I mean, you and I are old enough to remember when Japan had to go through that exact process with its banking system and its real estate sector because it had done something similar. And so all of the '90s was basically the unwinding of that. And the US has had it in phases. Europe had it big time in 2012, 10, 12, 13 where this real estate sector became unsupportable because of the debts behind it. And then it takes a long time, and the European banks have been broken ever since. And arguably, most of the US banks have been, um, except for this debasement of currency that allows for collateral to rise. So I'll ask a question, and there's some the assumptions that I'll then go into. So 
<laughs> when do you think governments are going to get sick of their banks? And I asked that question because, first of all, in the United States, going back to the financial crisis, they basically told banks to stop making loans, to, risky loans to the economy, right? So the banks have gotten out of the lending, I'm really over-exaggerating, but they've, they're getting out of the lending business and all of that is going to alternative or private credit hedge funds and whatever you want to call them. And then even despite that, right, a year ago coming up on March, they had the maturity mismatch, right? So they had to do yet another bailout of these regional banks, Silicon Valley Bank, right? Because they were, they were borrowing, you know, long, but it was only government debt. So they were out of the, out of, I'll call it the lending business, but they still screwed it up. So some, at some point, I wonder when they're just going to say, you know what, I'm just, I'm just sick of subsidizing the banks. I want to get out of this. Um, I think it's a really great question. I listened very carefully to the ECB. And look what's been happening in Europe. I remember sitting on the desk at Goldman in the late 90s, and there was an FT headline. There was like 18,000 different banks in Italy. And we just like, that's interesting because there has to be consolidation as it's going into the euro. And we saw nothing but consolidation. Then it all blew up. And then they've never recovered. None of the European banks. And then if you look at Citibank, I mean, the chart just goes like that. It's a flat line. And you see most of them, and then you see the next wave, which is the smaller regional banks. And I'd listen to the ECB, and obviously they're super keen to get this um, central bank digital currency out. And that is how you circumvent the banking system. I think the US is playing, I think everybody has a national bank. Now, whether it's private, remains private or state control, but it's essentially under state control. So Germany has Deutsche Bank, maybe two others. You know, the UK, everybody does the same kind of thing. And then the whole supply of money and direct ability to stimulate comes from the central bank itself, which is a breakdown of the whole banking process. What does it mean for banks? What services do they provide? It becomes very unclear. But if, it, if they turn it into a monopoly, then they can control the few. And I think that's what the US is doing. I mean, I think it's basically JP Morgan eats the world and the US wants it. Yeah, well, the, and you want to be an asset management firm, right? So you want really to have, you know, I don't know how big JP Morgan is in terms of asset management, but it's starting to become a very big part of their business, right? Same with Morgan Stanley. Wealth management's a huge part of their business. Citibank says they want to grow it, right? So what are the other businesses that are sustainable in the world of, disruption or crypto. I hate to say crypto, but I believe it. Um, you know, there are a couple of, you know, monopolies like clearing of government debt and things like that. But uh, it's margins can, you know, technology is going to put a lot of pressure on margins, seems to me. And I think that all the banks know it, you know, when you speak to them, I and mean, they've all got big crypto teams, they understand it's going to blockchain rails, you know, they've had their hands tied behind their backs, but they kind of all know. Um, and they don't mind some of that because some of the issues within the system are just the system itself, swift payment, T plus three settlements, all of that stuff. They'd rather not tie up all the capital into this either. You know, it's not them taking the rake on everything. I mean, they're, they're, they're a bit beholden. Here's a fascinating story for you, Yan. You'll like this. I had my global macro investor round table, um, in Mallorca last year. And there's an old mate of mine, who was an ex Goldman guy who was running National Australia Bank's um, fixed income, foreign exchange, and commodities business, their fixed business, and and their treasury, I think, as well. And um, he just retired. And I'm like, so, you know, what's been happening? What have you been up to? He's like, I spent the last three years in crypto, and I'm going to go and do crypto now, now I've retired. I'm like, what the hell? What the hell were you doing? Are you trading your PA account? He's like, no, I spent three years building stable coins. I'm like, a National Australia Bank? Why? He's like, nobody's realized is the US is going to T plus one settlement. FX is T plus two. We're in Australia where you lose a day. We need three days to settle. He said, we can't settle. So in which case, we have to give tens of billions of dollars to our brokerages, like Morgan Stanley and Goldman. To fund it, yeah. And he's like, we're not going to do that. So we have no, to settle. it's too expensive. I was like, 
hadn't even thought about it. And that's the whole world has that problem. Even the Europeans, you know, you've got to go to T plus one settlement. They still have T plus two for FX. You do have to change your funding. That's really interesting. Yeah. So it just makes me think that, you know, this snowball will develop. And I think your question is, what is even a bank at that stage? It's a financial services company, but maybe banking is is a direct to central bank operation, which is good and bad. Bad is they have complete control over your money, but the banks do anyway. And good is I think they can they can allocate capital maybe more efficiently than by the banking sector. You know, if they if they inject liquidity like now, everything goes. When what you might want to say is, you know, we want to inject liquidity in this particular sector. So, and knowing governments, they'll abuse that power and and central banks because that's what they do. Or just or just be not good at it. <laughs> I mean, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, the regulators were right there looking at the books. I mean, the train was coming right down the tracks. Every single quarter before that, they were taking capital right offs on the losses on their debt. You just you just have you just have to wonder. But it's a, yeah, it's interesting. It's a big it's a major structural I love the understanding these structural changes because it does affect how investors should put their portfolios together. Um, and, and in thinking about this, we talked about the, you know, kind of, uh, and, uh, the inverted yield curve and then that, nor- you know, normalizing, that's why it's really hard for me to figure out what the consequences are from an investor perspective. Like, do you buy bank stocks? I'm not so sure. <laughs> Normally that would be your kind of reference, right? Your, sorry, your, 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 uh, reflex. I'm not sure it is now. And, you know, so we talked a lot about this complexity of what's out there. And, you know, the opportunities you talked about are kind of far-flung places and there's few and far between this India, this Saudi, there's stuff like this. But what I realized a long time ago that we're building a new system. And if the world is going to get more digital, we're going to go to the new system. So I want to hear your crypto story. How the hell do you go from from a lot of kind of traditional sectors. And then, I mean, you've been quite a while in crypto, you know, as an investor and been interested. I'd love to hear your story. What was your seed? Where did it come from? And how did it grow from there? So personally, 2016, see, because the only, the the single word answer to anyone in crypto is, is the year you got started, right? So personally, 2016, and then my day job, 2017, uh, which is, not particularly early. I mean, it's sort of like 2000. It's not super late ETF. either. No, it's sort of like 2006 for ETFs. Like early enough. <laughs> I wouldn't call it like genius, but early enough. Um, listen, you know, part of a macro view is technology is as important, if not more important, than global political and economic trends. So, what you have to look for disruption. And especially since crypto was pretending to play, you know, in our industry, the question is, okay, what would, what would be the effects? And, um, you know, the first move was in 2017, do the, do the deep dive. We have a lot of our AUM and gold funds. Like, is gold going to get disrupted? I kept, before we go to that, who was the person who got you across the line? Who was your ground zero? Everybody's got somebody, uh, right? Yeah, uh, there were there were two. Um, one was my son, uh, my oldest son. Uh, so he was buying Bitcoin in 2016. But to be fair, um, he had done an internship at Horizon Kinetics where Murray Stahl is, and Murray was very pro crypto. So I'm, I don't mean to discount my son's enthusiasm, um, and he's been the space. But I just uh, just want to give Murray credit because he's not typically given credit for for that, I think, particular insight. Um, and then um, the other is this, uh, the founder of a crypto hedge fund who I met at a parents <laughs> event. <laughs> and he started going, he had been involved in Priceline and the internet, and he started going berserk on blockchain. And like, all the other parents were like, walking or running away from him. And I, I tend to like provocative people. So I, I have to give him um, 
credit to. Um, I, I'll leave his name out of it for for these purposes. But that was that was those those were the people. But to be honest, like and you do this as well, you have to do your own work for anything. You know, you have to separate fads from trends. Um, and so I had to do my own work in 2017, and that and that that took a while. That was was weekends when my when my family wonders what I'm doing. You know, that's stuff like that. And so, what did you see? What was your, or what is your big picture thesis on on crypto? Because it's a very multifaceted technology, right? It's gonna it's gonna play a big role in the business you're in, a big role in the money system, a big role in many things. So, what is your current working hypothesis of of what this is? So, to me, Bitcoin is a gold competitor, just like platinum and silver. And I don't think it's that interesting to talk about. But I mean, that's because I can't prove that. Um, I can only sort of say how investors treat it in, in, in their mental models, which again, I can't prove. Uh, but my basic thesis on, on Bitcoin, um, again, going back to March of last year, I was pounding the table because I said sooner or later, the Fed's going to stop its tightening and it's going to loosen. And then you want to be long gold and you want to be long Bitcoin, pounding the table. I think now short term, Bitcoin's overdone. And anyway, so let's talk about blockchain. Um, what I love, actually, I'll frame this as a skeptic. Um, I was listening. I'm listening to the Elon Musk biography, and he's he's a skeptic on blockchain because he doesn't know whether it's scalable or not. He wouldn't, for example, put Twitter servers on a, on a blockchain, and so I think that's debatable. I think that crypto enthusiasts like myself say the engineering will get there. So you can have and you can disaggregate where the functionality happens in that database, which has frankly happened since databases were invested, invented, which is that, you know, work gets apportioned between different functionalities in the hardware and the software. But my premise is that the blockchain will be reliable, which is really important. Um, and then we'll be able to have the capacity the thing that really changed in 2023 that I think gets misunderstood is that before last year, people were a little bit, that was the end of their analysis. And the most important thing is if you're a company going to use a database, the cost of that database has to be cheap and predictable. Not true for Bitcoin, not true for Ethereum, right? Gas fees are volatile, tr Bitcoin transaction fees and mining, right? And so, like, if you're a corporation, this is, I think, what came through in the success of Solana is just to oversimplify and L2s and all this other, is like, well, if you're going to have industrial use of, of this, you know, block of this database technology, all those things has to be scalable, has to be reliable, and the costs have to be predictable. And I think we're there. Okay, so that's that. And then my other view of skepticism um, is how does, who benefits, is it the tokens or is it the web two companies like a Facebook that somehow uses the blockchain to lower their operating costs? Um, and I would just say it's a bet. Like, you know, those of us who have allocated to crypto think that those uh, applications will move faster. We'll be able to have breakthrough, either it's a business to business or business to consumer applications. Uh, but it's not a guarantee. And that's one of the bigger risks, I think, for tokens is that companies somehow, you, if you will, steal the technology and, and, and get the benefits from it without necessarily the token holders. Um, but, like I, I, I use the analogy of the relational database. So a relational database is just a way more efficient database. It's like, I don't know, when it was invented 40 or 50 years ago. <laughs> Are there any real investment themes out of that? I don't know, maybe IBM and Oracle for a while, but it's not real. It's not a, you know, it's not a theme. So um, anyway, that's my counter crypto kind of story. And I think of blockchain as, let's say, the mobile phone network, right? We grew up in that massive disruptive change of mobile phone networks coming across the world. If you add up all of the mobile phone networks around the world combined, they're probably worth a lot of money, like trillions of dollars, a lot of money. The difference is we couldn't own all of the underlying networks, a share in that overall technology stack. But in this, we can. So we get the database technology stack. It's like owning a share of cloud or 
owning a share of the internet. That's kind of how I think about it. But I think your point is also very valid, is how much value is going to be captured by the applications layer? And I think big, I think that's why people are splitting up the people who can, their investment thesis via owning the underlying tokens, but also doing VC on top to like, you know, we don't know how this plays out. Because the other thing I'm worried about, and I want to see what you think, because you've seen many of the same trends as me, is I do worry that in the in the end, all of these blockchains are in business of selling block space. That's all they do. And we dress it up in many ways, but that's what they do. And they tell different stories around why their block space is better and they have different features and benefits. When do we hit excess capacity? And what does that do to the industry? Because we're, we're used to this growing every time, but again, we've seen this with 3G, we've seen it with uh, mobile, we've seen it with many of these things where suddenly you think it goes forever but before you know it, we can't fill the block space that's available and something changes structurally. I'm, I'm trying to think through that. It's somewhere are we not going to get this cyclical bull market? I don't think it's this time around, but I'm kind of worried where the next time around. You know, so I don't really worry about that because uh, there's so much economic rent, right? There's so much profits between, let's call it like a decentralized blockchain world and the way things are done now. You used the ex example of phone companies, right? So it's that's not where my eye is focused on. I mean, I, I think that's a long ways off. I, I could be wrong. I mean, I don't know. That's interesting. I, don't, I just haven't thought about that. But that seems like a long ways off to me. Um, you know, I, I do like to frame it by saying, you know, Van Eck, why are you involved in crypto? There's so many scams out there and whatever. I'm like, yes, there's 20,000 tokens. But if you narrow it down to the ones that are actually have economics where people are paying to use that blockchain or, you know, the ecosystem, it's not that many, <laughs> right? It's 20 to 50 real ones, and then they start, you know, falling off the map. So um, I think those are the ones we're talking about, right? Um, and, and so they're already getting, getting use and getting people are paying for, for using it. Also, one of the funds that you have within Vanek is a is a hedge fund that manages crypto. Right, right. And and my point is, it's not fishing. It's not picking out of a thousand tokens. Well, it's picking out of fifty. <laughs> I mean, the fifty change, the fifty change, right? And there's a new entrance, but it's but it's it's really understanding those and the and the potential new ones, right? But it's not like most of them you can just discard out of out of out of hand. Yeah, and Pranav's been on Real Vision a couple of times explaining his his process. And as a disclosure, my asset management company, XPAM, is an investor in it as well. So um, just so everybody knows. Now, I just want to get your thoughts around what it means for your business and for capital markets. So I'm thinking about, do we see the rise of the ICO again as an allocation of capital? And also, how are you thinking through tokenization of funds and the future of your business? The constraints for anything can be tokenized. Um, I feel like I've got a little bit of an insight as an ETF person because I've, I index very much on one basic, one big issue, which is liquidity. Who provides liquidity? Anyone can theoretically tokenize anything, but if there's a buyer and a seller, of an asset, so someone's got to make that market, right? And you think, oh, Jan, S&P 500, it's so obvious, so easy to price, but someone has to make a market in it, Raul, and someone's got to make money making a market in it. So it's not just the, oh, I can create a tokenized real world asset of anything, it's who's providing the, the market structure around the liquidity. So that's Big picture no question number one. Big picture question number two is, where can you do that without a lot of regulatory headache, right? And you know, in a, in the world today, you're not doing that in the United States. That's fine. Now, it'll be really interesting. You know, my my bet is on Europe just because it's got a large retail market. Um, you know, a as well as having a regulatory structure that enables, um, you know, crypto investing and, and, and trading and whatnot. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll see. I think there's, there's a lot, a lot of developments need to happen. But those are the big, the big things that I focus on. And, and what about 
let's say, the tokenization of ETFs. Well, so I go to that point. Okay, who's going to provide the liquidity? And and also, it has to be better. It has to be better than today's market structure. So well, when you I can at trade it on the weekend. I can trade it on the weekend, and I can instantly settle it. So I I can trade the SMH all weekend. In some markets, because there's plenty of market makers who are traditional market makers who operate in crypto, so they work 24 hours, seven days a week, and I can instantly settle it. I can store it in my crypto wallet, so I don't have to worry if the brokerage I've gone through is going to go bust. I lost, I lost a lot of money in um, in in uh, MF Global. You know, we've all we've all got war stories of where we've lost money. I just think that is a nice world. I could trade SMH yeah, all, all day. I you can you can trade night hours on Robinhood and a lot of independent brokers on a lot of platforms and if i if i took a bitcoin etf and compared it to trading bitcoin on you know coinbase at retail pricing it's cheaper as an etf the fees the management fee of an etf let's call it 20 25 basis points plus the spreads which i'll call it five to 20 basis points are cheaper than the 2% you pay buying and selling the bid offer spread at a re on a retail crypto platform. So that's my point about the liquidity provision. There's not, there hasn't been a centralized order book in crypto to force a, a very cheap, efficient liquidity for tokenized assets yet. We were, we were getting there, <laughs> and then we had a couple of hiccups. I can't remember what they were, but there were a couple of hiccups in the, in the industry. So, listen, I, I am, you know, I wish I could figure out a path, Raul, to tokenize our ETFs. Trust me, we, I hear the pitch every week, right? You can imagine. I'm just saying, what, what are my first two questions? How is the liquidity being provided, and in what jurisdiction? And then life becomes a, then it's a four hour Zoom and I want to go have a drink. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I think probably the answer to your question just lies in the future. And that's as simple yeah. as that. We know what the obstacles are. We kind of know the way the world's going. Is it going to get more digital or less digital? We know it's going to get more. Just what is that time horizon for that particular part of the digitalization of the industry? Just a, just a coda to my liquidity point. You know, this choke point. 2.0 to 3.0 that happened in the United States in terms, I mean, they were telling traders, right? Look at these Bitcoin ETFs. The, the authorized participants are not allowed to touch Bitcoin, right? So they're trading a Bitcoin ETF, but they're not allowed to touch Bitcoin. I mean, it's really funny. But anyway, those liquidity providers, the big ones that were in, in, in crypto, you know, they were told to stop it, you know? So a lot of them did. And it, it wasn't a rule or regulation; they just did. So, of course, Bitcoin and Ethereum and Solana are liquid. But you know, the you know the liquidity, the you know conditions in these markets, um, you know, are still a major challenge. Sorry, I just I'd like to pound that drum. So, final question is: is what's next in the ETF market? The I presume there's an ETH ETF, and there's the the battle that you all have to face with who's going to get the market share and how that's going to go with the Bitcoin ETF. Which I think is a bit unfortunate. That there were so many people going to market. Uh, it's a shame because um, you kind of want pioneers to be able to. I mean, you you guys tried to do this a while ago, and then people we were, come we in. Look, and, we and were like, first to file first to file a Bitcoin futures ETF, third to market, right? And now, uh, yes, with Spot Bitcoin, arguably second to file, third to file, and now someone who filed three months ago is <laughs> in the same spot as us. But anyway, that's life. And also, you know, it just felt like they just wanted a large, an even larger asset gatherer to be in the middle of it. It was just, I don't know, it just didn't feel right that you approve 11 firms at the same time. So really, it makes it very difficult, stupidly competitive for everybody. So what's next for you in the space as this space develops further? Because, you know, we're still early days. There's a lot to be done. What's next? You know, what excites me is what we were talking about, which is, you know, Europe and, and, and the on-chain world. And it's just not in the U.S., right? I mean, I described the United States approving, uh, not me, but 
maybe me, uh, you know, approving a Bitcoin ETF is like telling an eighth grader, congratulations, you finally made it into kindergarten. Like, it's just, like, it's just like ridiculous, right? Um, so given, given what's happening in the rest of the world, you know, and one asks, wow, this is what was so controversial. What's happened in the last 10 days, you know, of Bitcoin that's, that the people were so agitated about. Anyway, having said that, on-chain, real disruption at scale, meaning, you know, the, the, the um, technology that can operate at scale like Solana, you know, uh, or, or, or the L2s. And, and that's happening. And that's going to happen in the next year or two. That's really exciting. Uh, for, for us as an asset manager, we can get it through our hedge fund. That's it. And we can get it through on-chain, non-US activities, which we're doing. Are you growing your European operations to, to start looking into this? Or? Yeah, but not, not just listing tokens, but also literally on-chain stuff. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's just, you know, be able to explore that all. You've got the sandbox that now is Europe, which is weird that Europe's allowed the regulation and the US hasn't, but there we go, right? The Germans. Let's go. My mom's German, so <laughs> very, very excited about that. But uh, no, we're, we're going to... We're going to go into beta with some software projects, you know, later in, in, in a matter of months. And so that's to me, it's great. I love to be on chain. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah, listen, thank you ever so much. It's been a wide ranging, super interesting conversation. And uh, uh, I wish you luck with all of this. You guys have been pioneers in pretty much everything you've done. And I think that's, that's a really important thing. And uh, good luck and keep going. Yeah, let's keep the conversation going and have a, have a great 2024. And you, and I look forward to seeing you somewhere in the world soon. So a fabulous discussion with Jan, wide ranging. You can see he thinks like me in these secular themes, how to play them, how to take advantage of it. And I loved his story of crypto as well. You know, Jan is a real pioneer, a very humble, very nice guy who's built an amazing business. And I'm just feel blessed that I can have conversations with people like this and bring them to you. I hope you enjoy it. See you next time. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do too. So it makes a difference for us. It helps us attract the best guests in the world. So just click like. Obviously, please comment in the section below and uh, subscribe to the channel to get updates. All right, see you around next time and sign up for Real Vision. All right, take care. Hey, everybody. Today's Real Vision program is sponsored by Engrave, maker of the coldest hardware wallet, Zero, and stainless steel backup graphene. Engrave brings you the highest security in a touchscreen experience to safely manage all of your crypto offline. Enjoy a 10% Real Vision discount in engrave.io shop with the code REALVISION. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.